Hello, if you've seen the news recently, you've heard about this Roman Protasevich person who got arrested in Belarus after his plane was forced to land in Minsk. And you've probably seen news articles like this one, Roman Protasevich Street bid to rename EU roads with the Belarus embassy after arrested journalists. Belarus, Roman Protasevich's parents plea for help to save son and stop Lukashenko's evil. Internet news editor detained in Belarus amid protests over arrest of journalist. Belarus capture of journalist Roman Protasevich on a Ryan airplane threatens us all. So in this video I want to talk about this incident and I want to look at it from a broader context. So first of all I want to talk about the geopolitical context of the state of Belarus. Then I want to talk about the person Roman Protasevich. Then I'm gonna talk about the grounding of the airplane. And I'm gonna end it with the aftermath of the incident. So here you can see a map of the Soviet Union. And on March 17th, 1991, so half a year before it was dissolved, the Soviet Union held a referendum whether or not the Union should be preserved or should be dissolved. As you can see, 76% of the population voted in favor of preserving the Soviet Union. Mainly in the periphery, over 90% or even 95% of the population voted in favor. And only in Ukraine and Russia, only 70% voted in favor of preserving the Soviet Union. So why was the Soviet Union dissolved in December 1991 when 76% of the population voted in favor? There are many factors, but to summarize, you could argue that while the people voted to preserve the Union, the political classes did not. The political classes wanted the dissolution of the Soviet Union and only in a few countries, for example Belarus, the people and the political class wanted the preservation of the Soviet Union. This is why Belarus, Ukraine and Russia tried to recreate a new Soviet Union in the aftermath of the dissolution of the old one. Since 1994, so with a three-year gap, the pro-Russian Alexander Lukashenko served as president of Belarus and was re-elected for a fifth presidency in 2020 and will serve as president till 2025. Belarus has a presidential system, meaning that the president is voted in directly by the people. As you can see, Alexander Lukashenko is most popular in the rural areas of Belarus, meanwhile in the capital of Minsk he only received 64% of the vote, and in the rural areas he received more than 80% of the vote, and you can see that in the east of Belarus he is more popular than in the west. The pro-Russian and pro-former Soviet Union government in Belarus opposed many policies favored by the West, such as neoliberal privatization. And while to this day Ukraine has only 80% of the economic output since the dissolution of the Soviet Union and has never recovered the post-Soviet depression, Belarus had not experienced such a hard depression as Ukraine and has recovered economically much faster than the Ukraine. In 2001, Belarus reached its former 1990 economic output and ever since Belarus had one of the fastest growing economies in Europe, despite not being a EU member in any way. This is because Belarus has opposed many economic policies favored by the West, such as massive neoliberal privatization unlike Ukraine. And to this day, 80% of the Belarusian economy is publicly owned, unlike Ukraine where a much larger portion of the economy and the healthcare sector has been privatized. And even when looked at it from a relative perspective, Belarus has outperformed many Western economies like Germany, for example. While the Belarusian economy has almost doubled since 1990, the German economy has only increased its economic output by 40%. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian economy has never reached pre-1990 levels. When it comes to trading partners, we see that Belarus's biggest trading partners are Russia and China. And only then we find Germany, Poland and Ukraine. And keep in mind that with Ukraine we even see a trade surplus. All this underlines the Eastern focused relationships and with China's Belt and Road Initiative the economic output and exchange with China is expected to increase. So to summarize, the Belarusian economy is less dependent on Western Europe and the European Union. Regarding Ukraine, since the ongoing political crisis in 2014, Ukraine is divided into East and West. The West forces, the pro-Ukrainian forces, are more nationalistic and many are even openly fascist. Meanwhile, the pro-Russian forces are more socialist-leaning. Since the breakup of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has one of the largest shrinking populations on the continent. Currently, 
um, more than 50% of people live in poverty. Ali Gaspar, as is in Donetsk and Luhansk, stayed the same since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. They quadrupled and because the government is bankrupt, it was unable to pay the gas agency and therefore gas was turned off in the winter two years ago. And whenever there is economic catastrophe, this gives rise to fascism and neo-Nazism. But amidst the flowers and the children's tributes, flashes of something more sinister. Groups of armed men strut through the square with dubious iconography. That yellow armband is a Volksangel, a German symbol used by several SS divisions during the Second World War. Far-right graffiti is appearing, daubed on the walls of the city. When it came to confrontations with the police, it was often the nationalists who were the loudest and the most violent. A group calling itself the Right Sector is perhaps the largest. Its members can be seen marching around Kiev in columns of about a dozen. Mostly they carry baseball bats. Sometimes they carry guns. We met these men posing for pictures outside the burnt-out remains of what was once their headquarters. I asked them about their political beliefs. National socialist thematic. Sometimes for some people, it is not a unified nation. But not for everyone, it is not in the basis of this organization. It is for some people. And for you? In my own personal experience. In the sense, explain it. I like this idea of a unified nation. I want to be a united nation, that one nation, one country, one nation, one nation. А это подразумевается что? Что? Ну, как бы, чтобы чистая нация. Украина будет только для украинцев. Police have largely disappeared from the streets of Kiev. Law and order is maintained by so-called self-defense groups. We got a late-night phone call from another group known as C14, inviting us to meet their leader at their new base. It turned out to be the former headquarters of the Communist Party, now occupied by the far right. It's our general mission to totally ruin uh, chains that connect our country with the uh, imperial uh, power uh, from the past. And that being Russia? Yes, we can tell Russia, not only Russia, so Soviet Union. Are you a Nazi? Uh, no, I don't think I'm a Nazi, I'm a Ukrainian nationalist. And what does that mean? The main confrontation is uh, about that some ethnic groups uh, have uh, control uh, many business structures, some economic, some political forces. And, uh, Which ethnic groups? Uh, uh, Russians and Jews and the Poles. It may be uh, every, some uh, non-Ukrainian group control a huge percent of some economic or political uh, power. And, uh, uh, of course, in this situation, uh, Ukrainian people have uh, some uh, tension between it and it causes uh, conflicts. Mr. Karas says his group consists of around 200 men. C-14 is affiliated with a political party called Svoboda, or Freedom, which now controls four ministries in the new government, including the Ministry of Defense. Two of its MPs were recently photographed brandishing well-known far-right numerology. 88 stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet, H.H. Heil Hitler. So ironically, the US and EU-backed government of Ukraine is more nationalistic and more fascistic than the people in Donetsk and Luhansk who are fighting against those forces. Another one of those fascist paramilitary organizations is the Azov Battalion, which, unlike the C-14 movement, is much more subtle when it comes to presenting themselves to Western media. The chants glorify their race and celebrate the call of blood. The new arrivals go through their first exercise drills on this training ground in Kiev. Azov has a fighting force of around 1,500 men. The battalion has since been incorporated into the Ukrainian National Guard and as such takes orders from the Interior Ministry. 
At Azov HQ, fascist symbols also previously used by the Nazis, such as the black sun, are everywhere you look. Lida isn't bothered, insisting the icons are actually a lot older. Where did they get those symbols from in the 1940s? They weren't all new. Sometimes it's easier to adopt something that already exists. An exercise in being economical with the truth. The founder of Azov likewise vehemently denies that his organization has far-right tendencies. To the left-wingers and liberals in the West, just having basic conservative values is enough to be classified as a Nazi. To be honest, I don't really care what my enemies call me. Enemies is also how he sums up the entire political establishment in Ukraine. Azov has also founded its own party, officially distinct from the battalion. Right-wing parties and groups marching to the parliament building in the capital to vent their anger at the government. Azov's founder is the undisputed leader of the movement. Azov intends to unite all right-wing elements in the country, regardless of how extreme. And in parliament, which he was elected to in 2014, Bilecki has threatened other parties. We will summon up the courage, strength and determination to dissolve this parliament. Take my word for it. We have gathered here to begin the fight for power. Here's another report on the Azov youth camp where they train children to wield weapons. So family-friendly fascism basically and a white pride tattoo on the thighs but to be honest this is the least worst as of tattoo that I've come across. So let's talk about Roman Protasevich. Roman Protasevich is Belarusian who joined Azov when the war in Ukraine started. Here's a picture of the Azov Battalion recruitment magazine showing Roman Protasevich in an Azov uniform and wearing a rifle with his girlfriend. The Azov patch is clearly visible on his shoulder. Here's a photo album from the Azov Military Brigade in 2015. And on this Azov Military Parade we find Roman Perasevich wearing uh, yellow glasses and next to other Azov fighters, all wearing military gear, all wearing rifles and uniform. Here is another picture without the um, helmets on. The person on right of Roman Protasevich with the glasses can be seen to having a tattoo on the left hand side of his head and this is actually um, Stanislav Goncharov and uh, here are a few more pictures from his personal uh, Twitter. So here you see the same tattoo he has on the side of his head. Again here's the comparison. The same tattoo is, can be seen. And he has uh, other neo-Nazi tattoos like uh, 88 or on his thigh he has a Adolf Hitler tattoo and on the back of his um, on his back he has other tattoos uh, White Russian number one, 30th Grenadier Division and of course uh, Jews being killed by Nazi soldiers and uh, the swastika. And here's a picture of the other side of his head uh, showing the tattoo terror machine written in runic uh, alphabet. Goncharov was jailed in 2017 and serves currently 30 years in prison for committing war crimes. 
during uh, his time in Azov in Ukraine. On the 27th of May 21, the Belarusian authorities released pictures they found on Protasevich's smartphone and one of the pictures shows him wearing a rifle and in full combat gear and again with a Azov patch on his shoulder. Another picture shows him again with a rifle and in full combat gear with his uh, yellowish military glasses riding a Azov jeep. And here is the comparison again those yellowish military glasses. Also on his phone was a picture of him claiming to receive 1,250 euros to uh, spread anti-Belarusian propaganda. This picture was taken in Sena Miestis. The geolocation of the iPhone confirms this, so the old town of Vilnius. The text reads the following. I, Protasevich Roman Dimitriev, born 5th, 5th, 1995, have received for my work as chief editor of the telegram based sender Belarus of the Brain 1250 euros since February 2021. Two days after Protasevich was captured by the Belarusian authorities, Andrei Bilevsky, the leader of Azov, the bloke who claimed that he's just conservative and not a Nazi, released the following statement on his telegram I will immediately put all the dots above the eye. Yes, Rowan really fought against the occupation of Ukraine together with Azov and other military units. He was with us near Shirokin, where he was injured. But his weapon as a journalist wasn't a machine gun, it was a word. So keep in mind this was um, posted two days after he was captured. So Andrei Bilecki claims that yes, Roman was a member of Azov, but he was just a journalist. He was just in the press corps of Azov and he did not participate as a soldier. So now the question is, is this true or is it just um, whitewashing in the aftermath of his capture? Well, there's a news article from Nasha Niwa, a Belarusian newspaper, dating back to 2015, to the 18th September 2015, that interviews a anonymous soldier fighting for the Azov regime called Kim that's his call sign and unfortunately we have a only a censored picture of who this Kim person is. He tells us that uh, he received a injury in the village of Shirokin uh, when he came under fire from an enemy mortar battery as a result of which he received a shrapnel wound to the chest. Later in the text he receives he claims that when he was asked, remember your first fight? How was it? How did you feel when you first shot a person? The first fight for almost any person, even if he is perfectly grounded in theory, is a mixture of animal fear, misunderstanding of what is happening, fire, earth and concrete. The main thing in such a situation is experienced brothers in arms or a commander who will bring you and your body out of a state of numbness. And then the most important thing is not to lose your head and carefully listen to the instructions of experienced fighters. As for the sensations in terms of the first firing of a weapon in a combat situation, I had only one thought in my head. Either you or me. I think that's mistranslated here. Either you or me. However, I do not regret anything. Furthermore, he claims, when asked, did you have to fight directly against Carter Russian military un units? Yes, I had to. In general, the orcs have a clear gradation. Regular detachments of separatists will never receive weapons larger than a machine gun or an 80 mortar and then guess for yourself. When asked have you ever regretted going to the war he said my visit to the war was absolutely thought out and waited. So far fortunately nothing has to be regretted. Moreover it was here during the war that I met my closest friends who are also my brothers in arms. So the question now is who is this Kim? Well this Kim person claims that he is uh, 22 years old. Protasevich in 2015 would be 20 years old, but uh, it is quite likely that in order to stay anonymous he faked his real age in this news article. The question is who is this person that is uh, censored on this picture here? And the thing is it's exactly the same picture we found on, well the Belarusian authorities found on his mobile phone. 
clearly showing um, Roman Protasevich. So there's a news article from six years ago that where a anonymous soldier called Kim claims that he was a fighter for Azov, that he shot per people that he fought against Russians and that he was wounded in the exact same village where Roman Protasevich was wounded and the news article pic shows the same picture just censored of Roman Protasevich. This picture was also found on Roman Protasevich social media. It shows the battle flag of the Pahonia militia that fought alongside Azov. Pahonia is a region in Belarus that experienced far-right separatist movements and many of the now anti-Yanukovych protesters wear this uh, right-wing flag. Keep in mind though that it cannot be confirmed whether or not this picture was shared by Roman Protasevich. And this is actually the flag worn by most protests in Belarus right now and in protests reported by Western media. Почему я немного не приемлю оппозицию? Потому что символику они выбрали неправильно. Бело-красный флаг – это флаг коллаборантов. А почему я его не признаю? Мои родители вообще были в оккупации, и мне очень много рассказывали про войну, про все эти действия. Мой, отец, э, мой дед вообще-то был связной у партизан. И получилось так, что коллаборанты, то бишь полицейские, которые... So it's a thing we've seen over and over again. Some minor right-wing neoliberal protesters receive a lot of Western media coverage, meanwhile, which is in, currently in Belarus the case. Meanwhile, for example, left-wing protests like Black Lives Matter or currently right now in Colombia receive no um, media coverage whatsoever. And regarding police brutality, in Belarus so far no one has died due to police brutality. Meanwhile, in Colombia right now people die yeah, literally by the hour and get swept up in rivers. Or take uh, India half a year ago. Uh, in India we've seen the largest general strikes in the history of humanity. A quarter of the population was on strike for uh, like half a year, I think. I mean, this is incredible. Imagine 400 million people striking for half a year. This received almost no uh, media coverage in Western media. Why? Well, because those are left-wing anti-imperialist strikes and not pro-Western, pro-neoliberal imperialist demonstrations. And again, I find it funny that a person elected with 80% of the vote from the people is depicted as a dictator. It, it's basically what the West does every time it doesn't like a statesman. It claims that the election is illegitimate and that there was voter fraud and therefore the person is a dictator. This is a theme we've seen all and over again in Libya and Syria and Venezuela and Bolivia. I mean in Bolivia they even uh, couped the president and uh, only one year later it turned out that there was no voter fraud at all. So he will offer no apology despite global pressure because he insists that everything was done in accordance with international law. Now, he did really reiterate mainly things that we knew, which was that the plane uh, did make a forced landing after a tip off about a bomb threat. But he did add that the decision to land in Minsk specifically was actually an independent decision taken by the pilot after consulting with uh, airports and the airline. Similarly, again, trying to prove that he in no way initiated uh, Sunday's uh, events. He said that that warning about a potential explosive on board came from outside of Belarus, from a country over which he has absolutely no jurisdiction. I'd like to stress that the bomb threat message came from abroad, from Switzerland. And the thing is that the message was delivered to Athens, Vilnius and Minsk simultaneously. The information was immediately sent to the plane crew. 
We couldn't act any differently due to international law because the plane entered our airspace. The lives of 123 passengers on board from different countries and six crew members were at risk. It is my presidential duty to protect people. I was thinking about the security of this country as well. So don't dare chide me. I acted legally and saved my people and will always do that. So undoubtedly, Lukashenko trying to prove that this was a confluence over events which he did not engineer. On the issue of proof and evidence, actually, he said that more, including transcripts, will be released shortly. Now, just a quick recap. We are, of course, talking about the Ryanair flight that was making its way from Greece to Lithuania when it made a uh, diversion to Minsk. So the Belarusians claimed that there was a bomb threat and therefore they had to um, ground the plane. Now, what Western media accuses um, Belarus of is piracy, right, or terrorism, or um, hijacking of a plane. But this is simply not true. If you look up the international definition by the United Nations for privacy, it says the following. The definition of the crime of piracy is contained in the following article. Piracy consists of any of the following acts. Any illegal act of violence or detention or any act of deprivation committed for private ends by the crew or passengers of a private ship or a private aircraft and directed, one, on the high seas against another ship or aircraft or against persons or property on board such a ship or aircraft, or second, against a ship, aircraft, persons or property in a place outside the jurisdiction of any state. So now we see that outside of the jurisdiction of any state, detaining a airplane is considered piracy. However, in this case, the airplane was in Belarusian airspace and Belarus, like any other state on this planet, has the right of enacting its sovereignty over its own jurisdiction. This is true for Belarus, true for France, Germany, United States, Russia, etc. And actually, we all know a very perfect example for this enacting of sovereignty of a state. On 9-11-2001, what the United States did, they downed every airplane that was in United States airspace. So this is simply a question of sovereignty and not a question of uh, piracy or hijacking. But of course this frame of the story is being rejected because you cannot depict the president as a tyrannical dictator oppressing its own people. And therefore Western media decided to stick with the hijacking story instead. And now to depict a greater picture, I want to show you another um, grounding incident that took place in European airspace just eight years ago in, on July the 1st, 2013. And it was the grounding of the Bolivian president Evo Morales. Here's a picture of Evo Morales. And uh, the president of Bolivia was flying from Russia back to, um, from a state visit in Russia back to um, his home country, Bolivia when the airplane was um, prohibited to enter Italian, French, Spanish and even Portuguese airspace and was forced to land due to fuel exhaustion in Vienna. Now, um, under United Nations law, a presidential plane is a flying embassy and embassies um, enjoy special diplomatic uh, immunity. So forcing a presidential airplane to land in a neutral country is not compatible with international law. And now the question remains, why did France, Italy, Spain and other countries prohibited this flying embassy from entering the airspace? Well, it was at the height of the United States hunt for Edward Snowden. And the, the United States feared that Evo Morales had Edward Snowden on board. They pressured their ally countries in Europe to force the presidential plane to a landing. And after that, the plane was surged. And only after it was confirmed that Snowden is not on board, the plane was allowed to return and the president was allowed to return home to Bolivia. Now, imagine the uh, Russians... Um, detaining the German presidential airplane, detaining Angela Merkel and uh, she is only allowed to fly back to Germany where, after her airplane is surged. This is a clear breach of international law and it shows that the West only cares about international law when it's in its favor and when the West itself is not abiding to international law, they don't care. We denounce the lies the plot that the U.S. government organized using some European government with the aim to damage the image of the Bolivian government and the image and leadership of President Evo Morales. 
la imagen y el liderazgo del presidente Evo Morales. Muchas gracias. Tal vez más tarde. We were very surprised of the solidarity shown by our Austrian brother, the president of Austria, who came to visit me so soon. When they informed us, I had to ask my press secretary what was the name of this guy, and he wrote it on this. I did not even know how to pronounce his name. I just knew there was an American guy who had problems with his country. We do not know who invented this lie. Someone wants to hurt our country. Portugal needs to explain to us. France needs to explain to us why they had cancelled permission to use their airspace. And it's not just members of the Bolivian government who are angry at how the president's travel plans were affected. Many Bolivians feel the same way. To me, it seems outrageous that such developed countries who speak about democracy, who speak about things like that, of these illusions they make, I think it's terrible and, from my point of view, completely reprehensible. How can a head of state not be allowed to fly through other countries' airspace? It's like they did it to the country. Bolivian President Evo Morales has been elected by the people and he has sovereignty. Bolivia, no a nadie. Bolivia has not expelled anyone, has not invaded anyone. Bolivia has not spied on anyone. We don't understand this double morality. Instead of defending their own people of the largest espionage case in the history of mankind, to treat in that way a head of state, an indigenous representative of our ancestral people. Europe violated all the rules of coexistence because it attacked the international immunity that protects a head of state. What would have happened if a president from Europe had been treated this way? If this kind of incident had happened on South American soil? That's the real question. So I think this is a very good example of how the West treats international law. Or to quote John Bolton, the United Nations is just a tool in our toolbox. Whenever it suits the Western agenda, they um, demand that international law is to be followed. And whenever it doesn't suit their agenda, they simply ignore it and the media does not report on it. Or take the latest news. One day ago, it turned out that Denmark was spying on Germany for the United States. Where are the calls for sanctioning Denmark? Two days ago, the United States seized an Iranian oil tanker and sold the oil to the UAE. I mean, this is literally hijacking. They stole an Iranian oil tanker, uh, which was delivering 2, billion, two million uh, barrels of crude oil to China, and, and they sold it to the UAE. One, one or two months ago, a Israel bombed a Iranian oil tanker as well. Where are the calls for sanctioning those countries? And here we see that the West is measuring with a double standard. It is not morally consistent or even consistent in a uh, judicial sense. We have those two different narratives. Because in geopolitics, every news outlet has an agenda, uh, whether or not it likes it or not. So the question is not, do we have an unbiased source? We, because you will never find an unbiased source. The question is, which of the two sides show a more realistic picture of reality? Now let's uh, examine the Western narrative. The Western narrative is that a president who has 80% popular vote of the people, is threatened by a uh, Belarusian journalist who was formerly unknown to the Belarusians, to the Russians and to the Western media and therefore had to be um, kidnapped. Now if you look at the Belarusian argument, I think it makes more sense. A member of a fascistic paramilitary organization who is searched in Belarus and makes the mistake of entering Belarusian airspace and gets detained and uh, prosecuted. But if that's a more realistic depiction of the story, why does Western media love this um, political activist being detained by an authoritarian dictator narrative? Well, in geopolitics you always ask yourself, who can benefit from it? Well, the European Union and many European uh, politicians and the US politicians are now using this incident to um, sanction Belarus and to increase their trade war, therefore, with Russia. And this is, of course, in the favor of the West, or let's say in the favor of the United States, in order to uh, satisfy the sanctions against a pro-Russian ally.
And therefore what we now see is a whitewashing of Roman for the Savage. Since the incident he now has a Wikipedia article and currently there is being discussed whether or not they should um, call him Azov affiliated or a member of Azov or if he was just um, a journalist. And even the seven year old article of the Azov battalion is being re revised and people now ask well shouldn't we remove the fascism and neo-Nazi ideology from the Wikipedia article. So we see the same thing happening with for example Navalny where a clear neo-Nazi is being whitewashed and being repurposed into a political activist. And keep in mind this was only um, one week ago so probably um, the western media is going to report on it for the next few months and um, Proto Savage is more and more depicted as a hero and a political martyr. I'm pretty sure that once he's being uh, convicted and sent to jail, um, well, not to jail because the evil countries don't have jail, they just have work camps. So <laughs> when he's going to be sent to work camp, uh, there's going to be news articles about, you know, being mistreated in jail and, me be, and being on a hunger strike. And if you look at it from a more broader context, we even find that it uh, is just one piece of many in uh, the United States pressuring Europe to cut ties with Russia. Um, the conservative Chancellor Angela Merkel has too good of a ties to Russia and the Bavarian um, party of, the, of Merkel has uh, traditionally very strong ties to Russia. And in the eyes of the United States this is uh, of course uh, not uh, useful. And what they're now doing is that many US think tanks now push the candidate from the Green Party and the Green Party publicly said that they oppose for example trade deals with Russia, they oppose Nord Stream 2, they oppose lifting sanctions with Iran, they oppose lifting sanctions with China. So it is quite similar to what's going on in Latin America right now for example with um, Ecuador and Lenin Moreno a neoliberal party is converted into a pseudo-leftist, fake progressive uh, party that um, is now being advocated. Meanwhile, the real leftist party advocating lifting sanctions with all those states, advocating anti-imperialist policies, advocating a stop of weapon exports and advocating class consciousness is purposefully um, removed from the political sphere of discussion. And keep in mind that by international law, full-scale economic sanctions as done by the West is again illegal and the United Nations urged the West to uh, lift all their economic sanctions, for example with Cuba or with Venezuela or with Iran or with China. Yeah, but I think this is a bit going too further and I think that's a topic for another time.